I'd like to turn this morning into a big Bible class. Is that all right? Uh, I, uh, I just, uh, I, want, I want, if I could, to get you to find a pencil and a piece of paper. Find your pencil and your piece of paper. I want to make sure that at the end of this Bible class, you've got some notes and you can go back home and you can refer to your notes and you can decide whether or not this message is a fact-based message. I was taught in grad school that whenever you write a paper, whenever you do research, always present your sources. Let your sources speak. And so today, I've embedded in this lesson a number of scriptural references. You'll be able to capture those with pencil and paper. Then you'll be able to go back and ascertain whether or not I have misapplied, whether or not what we're looking at today is really truthful. Is that all right? I need you to locate two books, the book of Genesis, chapter 19, the book of Genesis, chapter 19, and then I also, I also need you to locate the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31 it's where I want to take our scriptural text from. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 31. And I want this morning to use the King James Version for this particular verse because King James puts it in a way that I don't think any of us can miss. Hebrews chapter 10 is where I will read our scriptural verse from. Our study will come from the book of Genesis chapter 19. But the thought, I don't want you to miss it, the thought comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 31. When you, when you locate it, when you locate it, say amen. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful, somebody shout fearful. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Don't, don't miss this. We play with a lot of things. As boys, we grow up playing war games, and we've got our little cap guns, and, and we run around and we talk about pow, pow, pow. As little girls, we play with our Barbie dolls, and we make sure their outfits are all together. But when we come to the Word of God, the Bible reminds us that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And so this morning, if you don't mind, I want to use as a subject, don't play with God. Play, play with your cars, play with your toys, play with your girlfriends, play with your guy friends, play with your job, play with your finances, but don't play with God. Help me, help me. I, I know you have no idea where we're going to travel in this sermon, trust me, but look at the person next to you. You can smile, you can be serious, you can be whatever you want. Take your index finger out, the person next to you, on the side of you, behind you, in the front of you, and, and just tell them, don't play with God. Tell them, tell them, don't play with God. Don't play, don't play. Don't play, don't play, don't play, don't play with God. 
Fool everybody. I, I, I had a friend, Jack Evans Jr., and when we, when we travel together, we love to just rib each other, and we play all the time. And, and I can tell when I get the best of him because he won't have a comeback, and his comeback will be, you play too much. <laughs> you, you play too much. And so this is one of those lessons that remind us, play with all the things you want to play, but don't play with God. Don't play with God. Father God, we thank you for this day. Enable me to stand before your people, not my people, your church, not my church, and, and to be able to dive deeply into your word, expound your word, help exegete your word so that your children might be able to see clearly your word, your future, their future, our future, and be able to prepare ourselves as we look at those things that were written aforetime. Lord, we are in love with you. Uh, the reason we travel to this place, not because somebody woke us up and said, you got to come, get dressed, come, but, but we came, Father, because we want to get close to you. Want to be in your word, want to hear you say, well done. And, and so, Lord, please minimize the distractions. The babies, the new outfits, the phone calls, the pressures of the job, the Bills that are on the desk, the pains that might ooze up in our body. Would you minimize all of that and let us hear clearly, let me be able to articulate clearly your words so your people can walk away from this place empowered because they understand and know your word. Lord, we love you. We thank you for these moments of study together. Enlight enlighten us, allow our mind to move through your word. And to hear your word like we have never heard it before. We love you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. I, I, again, I encourage you, I encourage you to, to grab a pencil and a piece of paper. And I want to take you on a journey. I want to make sure that as we study together that you have a reference point. So the reference point I believe this morning will come from your notes and from our sharing together. I know that you and I have been involved and we have been in a serious involvement engaging in the study of Abraham and the book of Genesis. I pray that this study has been a blessing to you and that you can say I know Abraham better and I know the God of Abraham better. And so when we look at the study and we look at where we have been, we have seen and we have met face to face the God of Abraham. The God of Abraham who is a God of love. Somebody shout love. love. When God called Abraham to follow him, it was truly out of love. Abraham lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldeans, Abraham, Abraham served false gods. He was not a Jew. There was nothing special about him. It was just the love. Somebody shout love. It was the love of God that called him. We love to talk about how God is a loving God. For God so loved the world that he gave his own. We love to talk about the love side of God. Somebody shout love. Yeah. Not only have we seen that Abraham's God was a God of love, but Abraham's God is a God of a second chance. Somebody shout second chance. We need second chances and third chances and fourth chance. We, we need an unlimited amount of chances and God presents himself to Abraham and to us as a God of many chances. When God called Abraham to follow him, and when Abraham and Sarah turned their backs on God's plan, turned their backs on God's provision, and introduced Hagar and Ishmael into the picture, introduced their own plan. You know how we get ahead of God. 
You know how we get tired of waiting on God? Somebody ought to say amen. We, we decide that God is not being responsive, and we take matters into our own hands. That's what Abraham and Sarah did. But even after they took matters into their own hands, God decided, I'm going to forgive you. We, we love that side of God that says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be red as crimson, they'll be white as snow. Yes, he's a God of a second chance. We also saw in chapter number 18 that God is an all-powerful God. When we walked up and we looked after 13 years of silence at chapter number 18, God walks up and God gives himself a name, a name that we had not found in the previous 17 chapters. He walks up and he says, I'm El Shaddai. That's the word for all-powerful. I'm the God of the mountains. What God proceeds to do is to tell Abraham, though you are 99 years of age, though she is 89 years of age, I am the God that can supersede the laws of nature. You're going to have a child. And we love, we absolutely love the fact that that we've got a God that says, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. If I was hungry, I wouldn't even tell you. And so we treasure those sides of God that he showed to Abraham. He's a loving God. He's a forgiving God. He's an all-powerful God. That's the kind of God, that's the kind of God we relate to. Somebody ought to say amen. That, that's the kind of God that... That, that we want to take around with us, a God that says, I love you, a God that says, you need another chance, a God that says, whatever it is, baby, bring it to me, daddy will fix it. Oh, we can preach about that God. We can walk the walk and, and preach the message because we love the God that says, listen, whatever it is, I love you, bring it to me. We can fix it. That's the kind of God that takes all of our problems away. Kind of God that we run to on Sunday morning and we say, I'm bringing you my problems. I got some financial problems. Anybody in here got some financial problems? Uh, we run and we say, God, I got some family problems. Anybody in here got some family problems? I got some health problems. Anybody got some God says, listen, I can fix that. Oh, and we get so excited because... That's the God we can relate to. But when we happen on chapter 19, when we get to Genesis chapter 19, and we look closely at it, and we see God, we see a God that we cannot relate to. We see a God that seems to be a God gone wild. So how in the world did chapter 19 get into Abraham's relationship with God? This is a hard chapter. In fact, I, I told myself as I was preparing, John, You've already talked about don't let the green grass fool you. You, you stepped into Sodom and go by. You don't need to go back there. But as the Holy Spirit worked with me, I, I saw another side that I believe the family of God needs to see. I want you, I want you, I want you to see this God in chapter 19. I, I, I know there will be characters that will appear, situations that will appear in chapter 19, but keep your mind focused on God. See a God who absolutely hates sin. See a God who not only hates sin, he punishes sin. 
It's all right. It's, I know you're going to get quiet on me because you get quiet when you get in this chapter. See a God, see a God who believes in judgment. See a God. Oh, my goodness, see a God who sends fire and brimstone from heaven down on people that look just like you and I. See a God who burns up five cities. Burns up everybody, every animal, every piece of vegetation. See a God that perhaps we would say in contemporary terms, a God gone wild. Prepare yourself. Don't worry about the characters. A lot of characters. But keep your mind. Keep your mind prayerfully saying, what kind of God is that? Genesis 19, beginning at verse number 1, two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they said. We will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, breaking bread without yeast, and they ate before, before, before they had gone to bed. All, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and and old surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them, shut the door behind them, and said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, 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 I have I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do whatever you like with them. But don't, don't, don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of the way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner. Now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept, they kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back in the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you, get them out of here because, because, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he, somebody shout he, he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry, get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry, take your wife and your daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, when he hesitated, the men grasped his hands, and the hands of his wife and the hands of his two daughters and led them out of the city for the Lord was merciful to them. Right. 
as soon as he brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't, don't look back. And don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, for you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, no, 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 my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to him, very well. I will grant this request, too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but, but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town was called Zor. By the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. It's daybreak, sunrise. People getting out of their beds. People trying to find a cup of coffee. It's another day. But then the Bible says in verse 24, then, then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus, he overthrew the cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the city and also the vegetation in the land. But lots. Oh Lord, help us. See, I, I, I believe I'm talking to a bunch of people who love the Lord. I, I believe that's why you're here. But our problem is we keep looking back. He's brought us a long ways. He's cleaned us up. He put a new song in our heart. But there's something inside of us that keeps us looking back. But Lot's wife looked back. And she became a pillar of salt. There are only a few occasions, though there are 66 books in this grand old book that we call the Bible, there are only a few occasions where God shows this side of him. We are so accustomed to the passages that remind us that God is loved. And when we see this picture of God, it troubles us. Would you, would you allow your imagination to just drift for a second? For a moment, see the smoke that is rising from the destruction. For a moment, feel the heat that rises from the destruction for a moment. Hear the cries. Hear the screams of the people caught in the middle of the destruction. For a moment, see the burnt and smelly ruins that is left from the destruction. Five cities completely destroyed. Only Lot and his two daughters. Then when you hear the words again in Hebrews 10.31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. You have to say amen. Then when you hear the title again, don't play with God, you have to say amen. When we, when we look at this chapter, when we look at this side of God, what we immediately want to say, because it makes us feel better somehow, 
we immediately want to say, you know what? This is about how much God hates homosexuality. It gives us a chance to hide our sin and to point to somebody else's sin. We, we say God went wild because it was about homosexuality. But you need to hear me for a moment. You, you please don't miss this. This chapter is not about God hating homosexuals. This chapter is about God hating sin. Come here. He hates it. He absolutely hates it when I lie. He absolutely hates it when you lie. He absolutely hates it when I get drunk. Happy hour. Let's go out. Party time. He hates it. He hates it when you get drunk. Hates it. Hates it when I steal. Hates it when you steal. He hates it. He hates it when I commit adultery. He hates it. He hates it when you commit adultery. He hates it when I cause dissension. You call it drama. He calls it dissension. He hates it. No, 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 don't get it twisted. This is about a God that hates when we sin. Then, then we try to make ourselves feel better. We say, you know what? I am so glad, honey child, that that's a God of the past. I'm so glad that I'm living under grace and truth. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. That's a God of the past. Jesus is my Savior. I serve the one who said, come unto me. Oh, ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my that's the God I serve. Is that the God you serve? If we love that, that that's the God that we can relate to. In fact, we relate to the God who son was sent and the son says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord. That's the God. We ought to give that God a big round of applause. Let's give him a big round of applause. That's, that's the God we serve. I, I relax. I relax a little bit because that's the God we serve. But can I share with you that God's son said, what you see in Genesis 19 is going to reappear. In fact, he is so specific that he starts to call names. Don't miss it. Luke chapter 17, verse 28 through 30. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of who? As is in the days of who? Is that on the screen? They did eat. They drank. They bought, they sold, they planted, they built. 
But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all even thus, even thus, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. This is, this is not a side of God that preachers enjoy preaching about. But since the chapter occurred, I, I just didn't want to tear the chapter out of the Bible. I, I want to suggest to you, in the most humblest way that I can, that the God we see in chapter 19, that is a real God. And that real God did not die. That real God will judge us in the day to come. We see this same side of God back in the early book of Genesis when it rained 40 days and 40 nights. The waters came down. The waters came up. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. Can anybody here, can anybody here in their sanctified imagination see houses that are being covered with water? God, what are you doing? Can anybody, can anybody in their imagination see men and women running and climbing trees and climbing mountains trying to escape the flood and then all of a sudden the water sweeped them away and somebody said, what kind of God is that? Jesus takes that same passage, that same setting, and he says it's going to repeat itself. Look what he says. Luke 17, 26 through 27. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. The flood came and destroyed them all. I'm almost through. I want you to think today. Over and over again, over and over and over again, the Bible warns us there's a judgment day to come. And just like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah went to sleep, woke up the next morning, woke up perhaps moving to get a cup of coffee, moving to figure out what they were going to do that day, all of a sudden, sky opened up, fire and brimstone rained down. The Bible reminds us that is how the last day will come again. First Thessalonians, write this one down. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse number 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a what? For when they say peace, safety, then destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not ye Christians, my brothers, my sisters, ye brothers, we are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. You, you are children of the light and children of the day. We're not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. 
For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God, I love this passage. In seminary, the professors wanted to make sure I understood this verse. For God had not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, whether we died, whether we are in the grave, or whether we are still walking on the face of the earth, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Say, listen, he says, you remember the body of Christ? Your member of the family of Christ, God did not fix it so that we would go through that day of wrath. That day of wrath is for those that are ungodly. And so he said, calm down. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right if you die. It's going to be all right if you lie. As long as you're living right in the Lord. But that's the problem. Wonder, wonder Sunday before God rained down hell and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Did anybody assess that situation? I mean, it didn't just happen. We like to think it just happened, but in chapter 18, God says to Abraham, listen, I'm going down to Sodom and Gomorrah, and I'm going to see if it's bad as I hear it is. That lifestyle is a lifestyle that had perpetuated itself. People had got comfortable in sin. I wonder, I wonder, did anybody say to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, God hates sin? I wonder, did anybody in Sodom and Gomorrah decide, you know what? I need to do better. Sometimes, sometimes the reason we get so close to sin Sometimes the reason we play with sin, sometimes the reason we get into sin is because we think we won't get caught. It is not because we don't know better. It is because there's something that intoxicates us, that tells us, you're not going to kick caught. You're too smart to get caught. Only dumb people get caught. You can dabble in sin. You can play in this. It'll be all right. Sometimes. Sometimes the reason we get comfortable with sin is because we think that God will overlook it. I, I, know, I'm, I, know, I'm, I know I'm looking at I know I'm doing stuff. I know I'm with people. I know I'm engaged in things. But you know what? God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's going to overlook this. Sometimes the reason we play around with sin is not because we're not good people. Sometimes the reason we play around with sin is because we really want to forget that hell 
is real. Don't, don't, don't go to church and talk about hell and damnation, fire and damnation. Man, we want to get to church and we want to run. We want to shout. We want to hear how good God is. But God is a good God. But there's another side of God that shows himself in Genesis 19. And that side of God says it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. That side of God says don't play with God. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, the Bible says, then, then he will say to those on his left, then he will say to those on his left, Lord, I don't want to be on the left. Lord, I don't want to be on the Lord, don't let me be on the left. Slap me, knock me down, trip me up. Send me to bankruptcy. Do whatever you need to do, but don't let me be on the left. I don't want to be on the left. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You are cursed into the eternal, into the eternal Lord, I, I wish that hell was just for a day or so. Wouldn't it be something if hell was for an hour? Okay, you've been bad, and you got 30 minutes in hell. Get you a cup of water and go on down there. 30 minutes, I'll ring the bell, and you can come up. Somebody say, I go then. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be something if the fire wasn't real? Ask those people in Sodom and Gomorrah, was the fire real? Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Just like people of Sodom and Gomorrah were judged, you and I will be judged. Just like people of Sodom and Gomorrah was judged by the lifestyle they live, you and I will be judged by the lifestyle we live. That's what the Bible says in Revelation 20, 11. The Bible says, And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from those whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw, and I saw the dead, small, great, stand before God. And the books, and the books, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged, the dead were judged, the dead were judged out of those things which what we write in our lives every day end up in the book in the courts of heaven. And the dead, verse 14, and the dead were cast, and the dead in hell, and the dead in hell, and the dead in hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whoever, whosoever, whosoever, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake. Somebody says, what are you trying to do today, preacher? Can I tell you what I'm trying to do? What I'm really, really, really trying to do is I'm really trying to call families back to God. What I, what I really like is if some family would just say, you know what? Some man would get up. Some woman would get up. Somebody, somebody would say, you know what? I'm, I'm coming back to God. What, what, somebody says, preacher, what you trying to accomplish? I, I, I really would like some man, some man who's been vacillating back and forth. I'd like for some 
husband to say, I'm coming home. I'd like for some wife that's trying to find herself to say, you know what? I got it, preacher. I'd like for some son, some son that, that's been doing all, some son to say, I'm coming home. I like for some daughter, some daughter to say, okay. The Bible says, speaking to Christians, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begins at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely the righteous barely No, it's not because I've been so good and I preached so many sermons and I did this and I did that and my dad did this and my dad did that. No, the Bible says if the righteous scarcely. You sitting in the back, I'm sitting in the back. We scared to death. Our knees are knocking. We shaking because he's going down the road and our name is about to be called. And the question is not whether or not he's going to say well done. The question is whether he's going to say depart from me. So we sitting there shaking together. Bible says, if the righteous, scarcely. Stand to your feet, would you please? Prepare yourself to respond. Prepare yourself to respond. Nobody's going to ask you what you've been into. Nobody's going to ask you why you're up here. Nobody's going to refuse you. The Bible says that God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want us to perish. God doesn't want us to end up in a Sodom and Gomorrah situation. It's real. For us as Christians, we look forward to the hope of eternal life. We want to hear God say, well done. We want the mansion, we want the robe, we want the crown. But there's another side that's just as real. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's the year 2012. The year 2000. And 12, it's this year. As a little boy, I remember those preachers that would come to town. And those preachers would come to town with their charts. And they'd get their charts out, and, and then they'd, they'd, they'd have three dispensations up. They'd say, Here's the very first dispensation. It's the patriotic dispensation. The patriotic dispensation is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the patriarchs. Then they say that patriotic dispensation lasted for about 2,000 years. Then they say at the end of the 2,000 years, 
the Mosaic dispensation. That's when Moses came on the scene. That's when the law of Moses was given. That's when God started working with the children of Israel. That's when God had the Israelites. He moved from the patriotic dispensation to the Mosaic dispensation. And then about 2,000 years later, 4,000 years after the creation, Christ came on the scene and the Christian dispensation started. Then they kept saying, we're under grace and truth. Christ has come so we could be liberated, so that we could have freedom, so that we could call God our Father. It's the Christian dispensation. But then they'd stop and they'd say, 2,000 years for the patriotic dispensation, 2,000 years for the Mosaic dispensation, 2,000 years for the Christian dispensation. Then they say, be careful. God's about to change things. And I remember as a little boy sitting there shaking, trying to understand what that meant. Astrologists. Astrologists predict that 2012 is going to be a year that there will be a celestial change like we have not seen it before. So the telescopes are focusing. The telescopes want to see what kind of alignment is going to occur that, 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 that we need to be all aware of. The movie 2012 came out. The movie 2012 was about the fact that it might be, it might be the last year. The Mayan calendar. Mayan calendar. Calendar that has tracked a series of events throughout the years. And when it gets to the end of 2012, for some reason or another, it doesn't track another year. The Bible says, the day you hear his voice, The day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. I believe that Jesus is still in the saving business. I believe that every chance we get, we ought to draw close to God. We ought to show God this is really who I am. I might stumble. I might fall. I might... I might, I might accidentally touch sin. I might wallow in sin for a second. But God, as soon as I come to my senses, I'm like the prodigal son. I want to run and get in your arms. Here I come, God. I'm, I'm not perfect, God. I'm not perfect. My mind sometimes, I, it just drifts away. I'm not perfect, God, but here I am. I love you, God. I just want to be in your lap. Whenever the trumpet sounds, whenever you call my name, I just don't want to be on the left side. Somebody today. How to make it right with God. Families, husbands, wife, sons, daughters, somebody ought to make it right with God. You've heard a portion of the gospel. Don't you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Won't you be bold enough to confess Him? Won't you be bold enough to repent of your sins? Won't you be wise enough to go down in the water of grave of baptism? If you've drifted from sin or drifted into sin, and you want to come home, why don't you start taking steps right now? Come right now as we sing the invitation song. Come from the low some way of sin.